Welcome back to another World Sociology screencast where we're going to continue exploring the concept of development. And as I mentioned at the end of the last screencast, traditionally there have been two main ways in which the concept of development has been operationalized. So we've either measured development by focusing on economic indicators or we've measured development by focusing on people's human experiences, by looking at different aspects of social development. And what we're going to do in this particular screencast is have a look at indicators of both economic and human development. And in the next screencast, we we'll look at environmental indicators of sustainable development. So hopefully by the end of this screencast, you'll understand the difference between uh, economic and human or social measures of development. And you'll also be able to evaluate uh, some of the key indicators that we use to measure these kinds of development. So economic development focuses on people's financial well-being. So economic development focuses on the wealth of a nation, on people's living standards. And the most commonly used economic indicator of development is what we call gross domestic product, which is often abbreviated as GDP. And gross domestic product, or GDP, measures the total economic output of a particular country. So GDP is the sum value of all of the goods and services that are produced for money in a particular economy. And then this measure, GDP per capita, is GDP divided by the number of people living in the country, divided by uh, the population. And this is to ensure that the GDP measure is not skewed by population size. So, for example, if we take a country like China, China has uh, a very high GDP. It's, in fact, the biggest economy uh, in the world. But because there are over 1.3 billion people living in China, it's the most populous country in the world, uh, its GDP per capita rank is not as high as its overall uh, GDP rank. Because when you divide GDP by 1.3 billion people, you get a more realistic view of the wealth of China. And this map of the world shows us countries colour-coded according to their GDP per capita, with a few exceptions. So the countries that are in grey are the countries where uh, we haven't got data. But basically the countries that are colour-coded blue are the countries that have uh, the highest uh, GDP per capita rank. And the darker the blue, uh, the more uh, economically developed the countries are in terms of that particular measure. And then the kind of yellow and orangey colours are those countries that are uh, less economically developed uh, according to their GDP per capita. And we can see that one region of the world particularly stands out, Sub-Saharan Africa, where you've got the highest concentration of countries that are... Uh, less economically developed in terms of their GDP per capita. Now the implication of a high GDP per capita is that the country has a healthy economy with high levels of wealth generation and in turn this wealth should trickle down and raise the standard of life of the entire population. However, uh, in reality, it's not quite as straightforward as this. And although GDP is a useful starting point for looking at development, we need to use that particular figure with caution. For example, though GDP is about measuring the economic output of a particular country, it doesn't include all types of work. So it doesn't include work that is not performed for money. And that might be the caring work and domestic labour that women mainly do in the home or volunteer work that people do in the community. So there are important forms of production and work that are not included uh, within the GDP figure. Another significant problem with using GDP to measure the wealth of the nation is it doesn't consider the distribution of wealth within society. So the average per capita GDP GDP 
might say very little about how most people live in a society that's very unequal. So if we take an example of an economically developed country like America, it might have a high GDP score and a high GDP per capita score, but we need to take into account that America is a very unequal society in terms of the distribution of income and wealth. And in fact, in the year 2010, the 400 richest Americans had as much wealth as the poorest 150 million. So it's really important not just to look at GDP per capita, but to look at GDP uh, alongside other economic measures that give you an insight into the distribution of wealth and income within society. And one of the most commonly used measure of inequality across the whole society is something called the Gini Index. So the Gini Index is a measure of how equal a society is in terms of the distribution of income. And we can see in this map that countries are colour-coded in terms of their Gini Index score, with the countries with the lowest number being those that are the most equal, and then the ones that have got the highest number are those countries that are the most unequal uh, in terms of the distribution of income. And another significant problem with economic measures such as GDP, which was highlighted famously in a speech given by Robert Kennedy in 1968, is GDP doesn't consider whether or not the economic output within society is useful in terms of its purpose or actually destructive. So you could make an argument that certain types of economic output to do with the arms industry, uh, to do with harmful products uh, such as smoking, are not necessarily socially useful. They might actually be doing more harm than good. So to summarise, I'm not arguing that GDP is not a useful measure. It's often a good starting point if you want to look at the overall wealth of a nation, if you want to look at economic development. So it is relevant, but we should be very careful about how we use it, and we shouldn't assume that higher GDP is automatically a good thing. So, for example, there are some countries that are very wealthy, but are not particularly efficient at turning their wealth into positive social outcomes for their population. So what you can see on this graph is life expectancy for men at birth. What's interesting here is if you take two countries, America and Cuba, they've got the same life expectancy for men. Yet America is much wealthier as a society compared to Cuba, which is relatively poor and economically underdeveloped. So what that might suggest is that Cuba... Uh, despite its poverty, is quite efficient uh, at turning its limited wealth into positive health outcomes for its population. Whereas America is a wealthy country, but is maybe not as efficient as it could be in turning its wealth into positive outcomes for its population in terms of life expectancy. So what I'm arguing is that taken in isolation, GDP is a problematic measure of development because it doesn't necessarily indicate improved standards of life for the majority of the population. And so faced with this problem, alternative approaches have emphasised that any measurement of development must focus much more on human experiences. In other words, there needs to be more focus on the actual day-to-day -day experiences of populations and the opportunities open to them. So human measures of development, what we also call social development, focus on things like education, health and gender equality. So for example, indicators of development in terms of education might include looking at the percentage of school-aged children who are attending school or we might look at the literacy rate, the proportion of the population who can read and write. Indicators of health and development would include things like life expectancy, uh, child and infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates, 
and access to healthcare services. And then as we see, uh, as the course progresses, the position of women within a society is crucial to development. So indicators of gender equality would include things like differences between males and females in education, in relation to healthcare, in relation to politics and other social spheres. Now there can of course be problems getting valid and reliable data on these kinds of indicators. Um, if we take education for example and something as simple as the literacy rate, uh, there are certain areas of India where you are counted as being literate not if you can read and write but simply if you can sign your name. So in some uh, areas of India, the uh, data that they've got on literacy uh, rates lacks validity, lacks reliability. And this photo that you can see is a picture that I took uh, when I visited a primary school in eastern Uganda. And Uganda is uh, a society uh, that has made uh, a lot of progress in terms of making primary education available to children. Uh, so they've got a policy of universal primary education where uh, all children have opportunities to participate in primary education. However, although that might look impressive as a statistic, when you actually visit schools, you see what that means uh, on the ground. These are class sizes. We can see that in this school, there's actually a primary school class where there are over 200 students uh, enrolled in that class. So though those children are uh, getting an opportunity to take part in primary education, it's doubtful whether or not they'll be able to learn effectively uh, given those numbers and those conditions. Now big development agencies such as the United Nations tend to rely not on a single measure of development but on what we call composite measures of development. These are measures of development that combine various types of measurements, various types of indicators and the most used composite measure of development uh, is something called the Human Development Index. So the Human Development Index which is published by the United Nations focuses on three dimensions of development. So it focuses on living standards so that's economic development which it measures by looking at gross national income per capita it focuses on education, which is a human or social measure of development, and it's got two indicators here, looking at the average years of schooling that children receive and also uh, the expected years of schooling uh, that is normal within that particular society. And then it also looks at health, and it looks at life expectancy at birth as the key indicator of the health of the nation. And in the Human in Development Index, countries are ranked according to how they perform uh, on these three areas, and an equal weighting is given to each of these three dimensions. So in this map of the world, we see countries colour-coded uh, in terms of how they rank on the Human Development Index. So the better countries, the countries that are near the top, are in the darker blue, and then the paler uh, the colour becomes uh, the lower the country is on the Human Development Index. So in this screencast we've looked at economic development by focusing on GDP. We've also talked about the importance of also looking at people's human experiences, looking at human development by focusing on things like education and health and the position of women. What we do in the next screencast is focus on something called sustainable development which is related to important environmental indicators.